Let's talk a little bit more about what is happening in court this morning and what has happened so far as this trial has gotten underway. Joining me now is Matt Harris. He is the co-host of Impact of Influence, the Murdoch Family Murders. Also, Mark Reichel, legal analyst to you both this morning. Thank you for being here. As the jury takes a break, I want you both uh, to weigh in as far as where things stand. And Matt, I'll start with you as you're watching the case unfold, both sides um, and their legal arguments. How is the jury responding to what has been laid out in court so far? Well, it's hard to imagine what's going on in, on their their heads, but they they are definitely uh, paying close attention, and they're they're not uh, flinching much when they're seeing the you know the, the awful crime scene. They're paying attention to that. They weren't didn't seem to be turned off by uh, the nastiness that can be seen in those exhibits. Uh, I, I think that you know the big thing that uh, has come up is the fact that Alec did not have blood on him, and yet he said he checked for the pulse of Maggie and Paul, and that's the one major thing that I think is jumping out right now. Right. So, Mark, let's have you weigh in on that um, aspect of evidence because it is being disputed whether or not there was blood spatter on Alec Murdoch's shirt the night of the crime. He was sweaty that night. There have been some reports that it could have been raining. It will really be interesting to hear from the forensic expert, the blood stain expert, Tom Bevel, who analyzed that shirt the night of and in the weeks afterwards. What stands out to you about that critical piece of potential evidence? Well, I, think, I think you're right on in murder cases like this, and I had one like this actually, is that we always say, look, science science is way better than feelings. So you have, may have feelings about some of these things and feelings about what you think happened, but the science is going to dominate here. And actually, I think, I think the defense has some decent points about the lack of blood splatter and so forth, because that's, that's something that you just can't get away from. You can't explain away from just from strong feelings about the case. Additionally, if you talk about the, you know, whether he has the blood on him based on checking the pulse, you know, often that you, what I think they should be doing is bringing in first responders who come in and have to admit that they've checked pulses, they've come to crime scenes and not got any blood on themselves. Uh, so. You know, I think it's a significant matter. I'm not so sure the prosecution has really driven it home so far and is necessarily leading at this point. Well, and the other thing that came out on Friday was the release of some of the video. So 33 minutes of video interviews that happened with Alec Murdoch just moments after uh, he came up and found Maggie and Paul's bodies uh, at the dog kennels. It was really interesting to watch it. There were a few moments where he gets emotional. Much of the rest of the video, he's very calm as he answers investigators' questions. Here is a part of that video. What stood out to you, Matt, as, as you listened to this account in this interview um, after w what we now know the events of that night? Um, I think there, w there would be some timeline issues where Alec was saying he was uh, didn't talk to Maggie for two hours prior to uh, him finding them at 10.06. And there is you know, going to be this video released uh, that was 8.44, I believe. Yeah, 8.44 with Alec in that. So that would be less than two hours. But again, I think that the state or the defense is making a good point about you can't really hold him to this timeline because his wife is brutally murdered, his son is brutally murdered. He even loaded a shotgun with the wrong kinds of uh, ammunition. And they're saying, well, that he knows better than that. So he wasn't in his right mind when he was giving these specific uh, time frames. I wasn't at the dog kennels earlier in the day. I was at the dog kennels during the day. So uh, those inconsistencies, I think the defense is going to be able to say, hey, listen, the guy was not right there. So he, he can't hold him to that. Well, and Mark, I'm interested in, in your analysis. It sounds as though the prosecution is going to make the case that there is a Snapchat video from the night of the murders that shows within minutes of the murders happening, Alec Murdoch is there. There may be an audio recording of him. How damning is that for the defense potentially? If they set up the first proposition, which is the timing and his statement, and if his statement, if they can really prove that his statement that he was locked in on the timeline and then show that it's not true, they can, you know, they're going to make this make you make the strong inference that it's lying. And if he's lying, why is he lying? Lying is consciousness of guilt. 
He knows his why. He's given a different timeline, different hour, and probably just for whatever reason didn't realize the Snapchat was going to do him in. Maybe didn't think he was going to make the statement later on that would be contradicted. But if they can, if they can, you know, line all that up and, and tie it up really well, I think it's a really powerful evidence for the prosecution. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider, and don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven and unbiased coverage.